move that on over. All right, can everyone see my screen pretty well and can everyone hear me? Change my name here too. Chat open. Perfect. Amelia, thank you so much and thank you for joining. I greatly appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. We are going to have some fun today, some great takeaways. All right, 259, we are almost there. Uh, we are just about to start up. I am going to go get this uh, live onto Facebook uh, and shared into our groups. And I'll tell you guys more about that in a little bit. Um, but give me one second here. Get this live on Facebook. State Technology Institute. Perfect. All right. Thank you to everybody for joining. We uh, looks like we have everybody streaming on in and joining us. So thank you so much. Um, I am just going to get this live onto uh, Facebook here. Give me one second, and then we're going to get it shared over into the group. Um, so give me one second to get this live. And uh, we should be good to go. All right, we are live there. We're going to share this in one more spot. And then we are going to dive on in. Again, thank you to everybody for joining today. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. And let's go share this. All right, let's, sorry, give me one second here. We're going to go put this into our Facebook group. Uh, just so you know, we have a uh, Facebook group, the Agent Inner Circle. Um, there are a ton of folks in there. It's about 2,500 people in the group. Uh, really, really great, um, great spot. Uh, so if, uh, if anyone is interested in joining us over there, um, we would certainly, uh, certainly love to see you there. And awesome. Perfect. Randy, I just saw it. I saw some people already already streaming over. I love it. Um, yeah, so uh, we have a ton of, uh, also, we have a ton of content in there um, as well. Uh, Andrea, I see you raised your hand. If you don't mind uh, throwing any question or anything you have in chat um, for questions, you know, absolutely throw them in there. Um, perfect. All right, perfect, here we go. Presenter view, we are all set, we are live, we are shared, we are good to go. Uh, Carrie Miller said, what did you say about content on another site? So um, I guess that's a, a perfect way to dive on in and a, a perfect segue there. Um, so first, thank you to everybody for joining. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Um, my name is Alex Camilio. I am the CEO of the Agent Inner Circle with agentinnercircle.com. Um, I am also one of the uh, head instructors with the Real Estate Technology Institute, which is who you are here with today. Um, it's a, a project that started with a good friend of mine, Craig Grant, uh, who is the, the founder and, and runs the Real Estate Technology Institute. So I'm always excited to come on here. I'm usually here about once a month uh, doing a live webinar for the Real Estate Technology Institute. Uh, Craig and I are, are old buddies in the tech world, um, and he is an amazing, amazing instructor. So I'm always happy to, uh, to support and, and to be involved as to be an instructor here is, is definitely an honor. So um, that is the Real Estate Technology Institute. As I mentioned, my name is Alex Camilio, CEO of the Agent Inner Circle. 
Uh, the Agent Inner Circle is a community of agents uh, all over the world who share and help each other um, grow their business. Um, Carrie just said, how long is this meeting? Um, so this is going to last probably about 45 minutes. Um, depends on how many other questions there are or comments in chat or things like that. So for folks here, um, if you have questions as we go, if you have any comments, things you want to share, stories you want to share, things that you do uh, that make sense in, in line with what we're talking about today, please, please throw those into chat. I would love to share them uh, with the audience. So uh, definitely, definitely excited about that. Um, as I mentioned, um, part of a group called the Agent Inner Circle, a uh, huge community um, that spans the globe, ton of content. It's 100% free. So uh, don't even have to put in your email address uh, to be able to get any of the articles or blog posts or videos or downloads or any of, of that sort of stuff over there. Uh, and it's been around for a long, long, long time now. So um, something I've been able to take over in the last about five years. So definitely pretty awesome. I have helped about, oh gosh, 15,000 agents. I have uh, spoken all over North America at conferences, uh, everything from local associations. Um, to the National Association of Realtors. And um, in doing that, I had the really, really incredible opportunity uh, this year to speak and to moderate a panel um, for the National Association of Realtors. And that panel was all about um, how to survive and thrive in your first five years in business. And what I was able to do was to really interview um, and go in depth with three different agents in different markets, different parts of, of the country, um, who are all have, have gotten really successful within their first five years uh, and have built consistent businesses and you know, really gotten over those hurdles um, and gotten involved in, in, you know, in the leadership and, and in the real estate community. So those agents had so many incredible insights that I felt like I needed to um, bring those to you today. And uh, if you didn't get a chance to go to the, the conference um, or you know, maybe you, know, you, you went, didn't go to the session and don't have the replays, um, I at least wanted to come bring you some of the major takeaways uh, that, that came out of this conference, that came out of this panel uh, that these agents really attributed to being uh, some of the reasons that they are so successful in their business. Now, these are really kind of amazing, amazing takeaways that I promise change these people's businesses. And I've seen change um, businesses for agents all over the country. Uh, as you probably saw on the, that first slide, I've spent a lot of time over my career, over, over 10 years now, uh, helping real estate agents all across the country grow their business in one way or another, whether it was uh, marketing solutions, technology, business building. Um, there's all sorts of things that I've been able to do. And in doing that, I've been able to have a lot of conversations with agents about the things that have worked and you know the things that maybe didn't work so well um, for their practices. So when I saw these panelists um, that were so succinct in what they did and and you know how well um, they sort of attributed, you know, their success and and the sort of things that they attributed their success to. I felt like that I really, really needed to bring that to everybody. So what we're going to do today is this: I'm going to start out with um, one major takeaway from each of the speakers, from each of the panelists, and that takeaway is something that they all said that was unique to them. So not something that was shared between them, something that was unique to each of them. After that, I'm going to dive into what were the shared takeaways, because I realized in you know, the months leading up to this, um, in doing all the interviews with them, in the month, I mean, it wasn't just you know, show up for a panel and say, hey, here's some questions. Um, I really spent months getting to know these agents, uh, hosting meetings with them, asking them questions, getting to know their businesses. And it was amazing to me that uh, so many of the things that they're doing were overlapping. So I'm going to start with the individual ones that are different um, for everybody. And then I'm going to go into, uh, you know, the shared takeaways, the things that it seemed like everybody were doing. So that being said, I'd love to see comments in chat. Um, if you have specific questions, uh, any sort of thing like that. Let me know. Let me know in, down in chat below. If you happen to go to this session or, or you were at NAR this year, um, let me know in chat as well. 
um, because I'd love to see, you know, who is at NAR this year, who went to sessions. So let me know in chat who was there this year. Uh, and then we're going to, we're going to dive right on in. So the first one is this, and I love this one. Um, I got to ask the question of what was the worst piece of advice that you've ever received or that you received early on in your business um, and that you really had to get over. And, and all of the panelists had great uh, responses, but Nicolette Mascari, uh, who is an agent at Compass, Compass uh, she lives in North Andover, Massachusetts, which uh, her market is sort of more a luxury side, um, you know, higher end suburbs, very nice suburbs of Boston uh, market. So definitely a challenging market for her to break into, right? A lot of, of established agents in that area. It's a luxury market. It's, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but she was able to do it and do it in a, a reasonably short amount of time. And in doing that, um, I asked what was the worst piece of advice. And what she said is the worst piece of advice was somebody and, and a bunch of agents and friends and so on were telling her that she needs to be patient and that you just, you won't get business overnight. It's not just going to happen overnight. Um, and for her, she said that with, you know, a family that she had to support, uh, she knew it was time to, you know, forget about being patient and go out and hustle and drive business um, however she could. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some virtues to being patient, right? You, there are a lot of marketing plans that you know are, are going to, uh, and Nicolette will even say it, she actually will say, you know, plant an orchard. Um, you're not going to go harvest your orchard immediately. Um, but there are certainly some things that you can do to go out and start generating uh, leads, generating your sphere, reaching out to the people who you already who already know, like, and trust you. Um, one of the things she mentioned was that she put together a letter uh, to her whole sphere to let people know um, about her getting into the business and making this transition and uh, what she was doing for that. And she said the response to it was, was really, really incredible and was outstanding for her. So she wasn't going to be just patient that her sphere was going to convert and turn into clients for her. She knew she actually had to go out and get it and do some work to try to drive business um, from maybe some, some people she already knew, some you know, folks she already knew uh, in that area and in her sphere. Now, the next one, the next individual point um, came from Carissa Thompson. And Carissa uh, is another just incredible agent. She is in Auburn, New York, um, which is sort of a, a central or we'll call it Finger Lakes region, essentially, um, but sort of central New York, uh, central or northern New York area. And um, one of the questions I got to ask everybody was, uh, what helped you create a consistent business? Because it's not just about, you know, going out, getting some leads and hustling and, and you know, being afraid of where that next deal is coming from. Um, it really comes down to, uh, you know, doing the right things uh, to create consistent business that you know next month and the month after that and the month after that, that you're going to have leads coming in, you're going to have deals coming in, and you're going to be able to convert um, on those. Now, when I asked her this, uh, she said that for her, one of the biggest things that made the differentiator was uh, mentorship and that she was able to find those mentors um, through association involvement, uh, specifically local leadership, getting involved in her local association, um, and then getting involved in education. She talked about going to Triple Play Conference. She talked about going to, and actually, let me ask, if you have any favorite conferences or events or things like that that you go to, I would love to see you uh, drop those in chat um, because you know there are so many great events and associations to get involved with. Uh, for her, that made the difference, um, and I know it has made the difference for a lot of agents. Once she got involved and got involved in leadership and put herself in all of those positions where a lot of the highly successful agents uh, tend to, you know, hang out, um, she got and quickly figured out that she could bring on a number of mentors, um, really, you know, soak in information um, and and just kind of take it to the next level. So, she saw the high level of service that agents in other parts of the country were were giving to their clients. The things that they were out they were out doing that was you know different um, and maybe made her stand out from what folks were doing you know in her local market. 
Um, she met a bunch of local of mentors that she still works with. And she always mentions that it's multiple mentors, not just, you know, found one person to talk to. Um, and then she learned from some of the best. And I think uh, getting out and getting active, um, you know, really is uh, incredibly important in terms of um, being able to grow your practice and grow into something that will be a consistent business. Because when you do start getting up against those hurdles of creating a consistent business, that's where mentors uh, often can step in and help um, and point people in the right direction. Now, from there, I'm going to go on to um, Jairo Rodriguez. And Jairo did an amazing, amazing job. Um, Jairo is with uh, Prominent Properties Sotheby's, um, and he's in Woodland Park, uh, New Jersey. Um, so again, we, we've got agents sort of scattered all over the Northeast, um, different markets, different population sizes, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I got to ask um, all of them a, a, another really great question about uh, overcoming the plateau. And, um, it, you know, we're talking, and I think this happens to all of us in any business, really, not just uh, the real estate business, but it was, have you hit a plateau uh, in your business and what did you do to overcome it? Um, and Hiro was, it was really interesting because Hiro said something where he said, do what works for you. And, and, and we all kind of laughed when, especially when we were doing this, um, you know, before it was live and we were, you know, meeting about all of this because we said, well, yeah, that sounds really easy, right? Do what works, but it's not really that easy when you think about it and, and what you have to do to make sure that you're in a position to be able to do what works. And what I mean by that is this. If you don't have uh, diligent record keeping or you don't have a laser-like focus um, to avoid a bunch of the shiny pennies and say, no, 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 hold on. I, I know what works for me. Uh, I know, you know what I'm going to be able to do um, and, and do consistently and, and follow up on and work at and so on, um, that you, you can't really figure out what has worked for you. Or what will work for you if you keep getting distracted, not giving whatever project you're working on time, um, and instead, you know, you're not keeping records and saying, okay, I've given this a long enough period of time. I've really tested how this thing is working for me um, or what it might be doing. And uh, it's just interesting to see because this is where we start to really get into some of the concepts um, that were... Uh, really held by a lot of different um, of the speakers and of the panelists and of a lot of the successful agents that I've talked to um, over a long period of time. So I think at this point, instead of getting too much into the whole record keeping and laser-like focus piece, I'm going to dive into some of the shared takeaways. Now, before I do that, um, I'm going to mention that, uh, you know, we've talked about Hiro, we've talked about Carissa, we've talked about Nicolette. These are the panelists for the NAR conference, and these are the where we're getting the shared takeaways going forward. At the very end, um, I'm also going to be sharing a group uh, where if you want to get involved and ask any of them questions directly, uh, all three of them are involved heavily in the Agent Inner Circle group, which I mentioned at the beginning, but I will include a link for at the very end. Um, as well as we have a specific group for this event, for the, the zero to 60 panel that we did for the NAR conference, that you're welcome to join, um, that we have a group together, and they are more than happy to answer questions in there as well in a very you know, small, comfortable uh, environment, and, and they're always happy to help. So um, we'll get to that, but I just wanted to mention and shout out those three uh, incredible, incredible panelists. Um, before we start getting into the shared takeaways from all of them. Now, the shared takeaways, and, and for some folks, these might just be great reminders. Um, for some folks, you know, uh, maybe you, this is the first time you're seeing some of these things, and hopefully we can give it, um, for those folks that have seen these things, a little bit of a different spin or some perspective and some of the stories um, from some of these agents that make it so, so relevant. Now, before I get any further, um, if anybody has any questions um, or comments, I would love to see them in the chat. Um, please feel free to throw them down in there and uh, you know, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to answer stuff. 
So again, thank you to the folks who, uh, who have joined us today. So the shared takeaways um, for this event and for agents, some of the, the most highly successful agents that I know, um, is first of which, treat your business like a business. You want to take service to another level. Um, your network or your sphere is really the core of your business. Um, you want to get involved locally, and it's all about determination over discouragement. And I'm going to get into these in a little bit more detail. So the first thing is treating your business like a business. And I know, you know, that might sound cliche or, or you know, we don't really think about it in that way. But I always ask questions like, you know, if you were to disappear tomorrow, are, are your things documented to such an extent that somebody could step in and take over? and do your job tomorrow if they needed to. And I feel like that's always a great indicator of how well <clears throat> am I structuring this like a business, to be able to grow it, to be able to bring on teammates if I want to, to adequately send information or send projects to a virtual assistant. Um, there are all sorts of you know different things where we start thinking about, do we really treat this like a business or do we treat this like a job? And the more you can do to treat um, everything you're doing as an individual agent, like a business, the better you're going to do. And this comes down to tracking an, an organization at its core. Mm. And what was interesting to me, and, and I guess a little anecdote or story here for you, um, as we were doing all of these uh, you know, setups and meetings and so on before the actual panel, one of the questions that I planned on asking the agents was, uh, where did your, and, and I did end up asking the panel was, where did your um, first four to five deals come from? How, where did the, like, where, what lead source, uh, you know, what, where was it? And um, it was interesting because all of them immediately went and, and like, it was funny because you could tell they were all either on multiple monitors or like on, you know, working on a couple things here. And immediately they just, within a couple clicks, bring up whatever either CRM or tracking tool or whatever it is that they were using and immediately knew who their first five clients were, um, the kinds of things that you know went on in the deal, the follow-ups that they've done with these people since the deal happened, and, and all, all three of them immediately, and it wasn't like, oh, hold on, let me think of who the, the first five people were, and they all immediately knew who the first person was. So the first two people might have been gone, oh yeah, I knew, I knew those couple deals. But a very few of them, a very few agents I know out there can, um, you know, click and within a couple clicks say, oh yeah, deals five through 10 were X, were these set of people and here's what I'm doing with them today. So it was very clear that all of them had a very, um, very good level of tracking and organization uh, in their businesses. It was also very clear that they did uh, market research. Uh, Hiro talked about, you know, at points he was doing things like door knocking or cold calling or so on, but it wasn't like he would just show up and door knock anywhere or cold call anybody or so on. It was about doing some market research and about understanding where to go knock and who to talk to and you know, those sorts of things to do in the very, very early days in his career when he was trying to do um, a lot of, of sort of hard and direct sales type stuff. The so next thing is goal setting. And what I thought was very interesting in this um, was not just to, you know, have goals. But what was interesting to me is that most of them had sort of a different take on goals than what you hear from a lot of folks. So a lot of folks out there are like, oh, go make these huge, enormous goals. And you need to, you know, make these like massive goals that, um, you know, even if you don't achieve them, right, so it's that shoot for the stars, even if you don't achieve it, you'll end up that sort of a thing. But the problem is the way our psychology and the way our mentality works is a lot of times if the goal is too big, and we don't see a path toward getting toward that goal, we'll either give up or procrastinate or not have the direction or things of that nature. So what they seem to say, and Carissa, uh, Carissa Thompson really brought this up, but what the whole group um, seemed to say very well is that 
they're more about setting small achievable goals. Maybe a little bit of a reach, you know, push yourself, you're competitive. So push yourself a little bit, but give yourself something that you can actively accomplish because you can always set another goal. You can always change the mile marker at the end and say, oh, well, awesome. I hit that. I want to go hit this next thing. But if you've given yourself a goal that's too big, then it turns into you ha somebody has to say to you, you know, how do you eat an elephant? And it's one bite at a time. Well, it's the same sort of thing. Instead of having to break it down into bite-sized chunks, try setting some of those chunks um, and those achievable goals to begin with. Uh, and I think that was a, a big one for them. And this all culminates in do what works. So, you know, Hiro mentioned it very specifically in terms of hitting a plateau. Um, and it, it, may, it very much make, made sense about going back to doing what works for you. But all of that doesn't happen if you don't treat your business like a business. And this is something that all of these agents did incredibly successfully um, was treat their business like a business, track it accordingly, organize it correctly, do their market research, um, you know, do research in general, set achievable goals for themselves, um, and then do what they know works to achieve those goals. And when you lay it out like that, it sounds, it sounds pretty simple, right? Um, now, obviously, I know I make it sound a lot more simple than it is, but um, at least you have a start and a roadmap there uh, to achieve those things. The next thing beyond treating it like a business is that they all were providing, I'll call it service at another level. And what I mean by that is they were all doing things that you don't see from agents everywhere. That, that make them stand out, that you can tell is that extra little bit of concierge um, and thought that they're putting into uh, working with their clients. So first, um, Pyro is one thing he kept talking about over and over again is sort of focusing on the Disney experience. And um, I, you know what's funny is I there's an article on Agent Inner Circle that I wrote from February about... Uh, lessons from a Disney vacation. And it was, I mean, it was all about, um, we went to Disney uh, and just everything you could learn about the customer service and the, the over the top, you know, next level service that, uh, you know, that Disney does. So if you haven't experienced it, um, hopefully at some point you can in the future and under the same conditions I was able to. Um, for those that haven't, or even that have, check out the, the Disney article because I think there's some interesting things in there uh, that will stand out. But Hyro does a really interesting job um, talking about that and making sure that he does that with his clients. Carissa, uh, again, just does a, an awesome job going over the top um, and standing out to her clients. Now, where she is in New York has like a 60 to 70 day, 75 day process to get people into homes. And it's just, it's, it's longer than it is in other parts of the country. Um, and she does what she can to make that waiting process and that, you know, big, long process for properties um, as fun as she can. So she'll do things like send gifts, small little gifts to their work, um, to their workplaces with little notes of encouragement and, you know, things to, to keep people excited and, and, you know, into the process. The other thing she does that I thought was so cool is she will pay for dinners. Um, for people, like if she knows like, oh, this couple is going to, to dinner here tonight, or she sees on social media, like, oh, they just checked in at dinner. She'll actually call the restaurant and say, hey, this is a client of mine. I'd like to buy them dinner. Can I please put this on my card? She'll actually buy them dinner as a surprise because they checked in and, and they know each other and so on. Those are our personal levels. Those are things that I don't see a lot of agents doing. You know, maybe they'll take a client out to dinner uh, or things like that, but like surprising them because they saw it on Facebook, um, I think is is really an interesting one. Um, sorry, I'm back up here. Um, and then um, the last is Nicolette and Nicolette, again, just concierge. So Nicolette has helped clients move. I mean, move boxes and do stuff like that. I would not necessarily recommend that for everybody. Um, but, you know, she really goes to the next level, very concierge sort of style. She's like watched, ki watched 
kids of her clients before and, and babysat for people. Um, and she's a mom herself, so she's very, you know, comfortable and known in the parenting groups and mom groups and so on in her community. So I think people are very comfortable doing that. Um, she brings toys and snacks for kids when she goes to sell homes. So, so she worked on the buyer's side um, for a lot of the early stage of her career, and she still does a good bit of work on the buyer's side. And what it was is there were a lot of people, she and I are similar ages, mid-30s, we're moving out of Boston um, in, and into what's called Metro West, which is sort of the, the suburbs or the nicer, some, somewhat wealthier suburbs um, from the area. So she was able to sort of catch that tide of people that were moving between areas. She got a ton of the buyers because she really understood her market, her demographic, you know, her age group, what they were looking for, all of those sorts of things. Um, and she would do things like bring toys and snacks for the kids because those are the people that were coming out and make sure that she's helping out with those kids. So the parents can actually talk to one another while they're looking at a home and, and not be distracted and pulled in 12 different directions and all that sort of stuff. Um, I always thought that's, that's really incredible. And then all three of them mentioned this last one, which was personalized gifts. Um, you know, closing gifts are great. Um, but and any closing gift is great, don't get me wrong, uh, but the more personalized the closing gift is, uh, the better it tends to be, the more thoughtful it is. Um, it, there's two aspects to a gift, okay? There's the value that the gift is going to bring to that person in their life, and there is the uh, perceived time that someone spends thinking about a gift and going through the effort to figure out what you like, who you are, what will work for you, and maybe even have a surprise in store. Um, so I think when people interpret gifts, uh, it's not just about, oh, this is a cool thing that's gonna help me. It's like, oh, this is, damn man, this person really thought this through. Wow, they really cared or were paying attention or knew what I, you know, really knew me and knew what I wanted, knew us, um, you know, and, and that really, comes down to the the job that you're doing, communicating with your clients, how you're working with them and so on. But all three of them said that they do personalized gifts uh, for closing gifts for people. And I would recommend it. I honestly would recommend um, that to anybody in terms of, of adding that extra little thought piece to it. Now, this is one that uh, I talk to agents about all the time. This is something I know, you know, in my heart of hearts to be true. Um, which is that your network is your business. And this is something that all of these agents talked about consistently. And I mean like super consistently. So two out of the three panelists had their first four to five deals come from their sphere. The third um, panelist currently now gets the majority of their business from their sphere. So of all of these successful agents, um, they were all able to, within the first five years in business, build a business that's paying them very, very well, and they're doing very well as a result from working their network, their sphere of influence, their friends, their family, their past clients, their, their clients' referrals. Um, and it was, I shouldn't say astounding, but it was really interesting to see that even the, the agent who didn't necessarily start with that um, moved over to that. The other thing that I think it, it really tells us is sort of, I think it dispels a rumor, which I feel like sometimes agents feel like, you know, oh, there's, there's, there's these agents who've had their networks and their spheres and whatever for 30 years. And yeah, they get all this, these deals because they built up their network over 30 years. Well, yes, there's some there's something to that, the amount of time getting put in. But what these three agents show us is that it doesn't take 20 or 30 or 10 or even five years to create and actively work a sphere of influence to the point that you are generating business. Um, I mean, you know, uh, Nicolette was doing it in a year, less than a year. Um, first four to five deals came from it. Carissa, same thing. Cairo, within a year of starting, quickly transitioned over into mainly focusing on his sphere, um, his sphere of influence. And even early in his career, while he was working those cold leads, uh, he was also, he's a, um, 
a uh, former uh, petty officer in the Air Force. And uh, he, you know, thank you, um, Hiro. Um, but Hiro, you know, was going after some cold leads at the beginning, but switched it up and started doing things with his American Legion. Um, got really, really active with the Legion. And, uh, and then next thing you know, was converting business out of it there. But I think the interesting part to me is that um, all of these agents, when they talk about getting involved locally, and that was, you know, when they're working their sphere, the, the sort of tangent to that is that a lot of this is not just the people they already knew, but the ways that they were getting involved locally. They all made it a point of saying that it's not just about getting involved, but that, you know, that you're doing it for business. You actually have to want to be doing this. You actually have to have some sort of passion for the thing that you're doing, enjoy the things that you're getting involved with, um, you know, find those sorts of passions and things that you want to be involved with in the community. And business will come out of that if you do those things correctly. Uh, and if you figure out ways to work those spheres and, and those groups and so on. But um, it's, like I said, it's you, you've got to get involved, want to get involved, do something that you're enjoying. And then there are other ways to work business from that. So they all talked about different things they've been involved with, local association leadership, various community projects, uh, charities. They've hosted their own events. Um, and I think a combination of all of those is really where, uh, you know, they've been able to grow and expand those networks. Um, you know, Carissa is incredibly involved with a lot of different things. Uh, I know she's involved with a, an autism awareness and support groups. Um, I know, uh, like I said, Hiro is very involved in his legion. Um, Nicolette is incredibly involved in her community doing, like I said, mom groups and uh, play dates for kids where she's, you know, the one organizing everything, um, you know, PTA type stuff, parent groups, I it just on and on and on um, community projects that you see her involved in. So all of them seem to be uh, very common in doing that and, and in being involved locally and then being able to drive business um, and drive business from that. You know, do asks, do follow-up campaigns, send people stuff that you've met within the groups uh, and turn that into business. Now, um, the last one that I want to go over here is they all talked about determination over discouragement and that we are all going to get discouraged at some point in time. It's just, it's going to happen. Whether you're a year into business, whether, I mean, heck, getting into business to begin with is scary. I mean, that's a, a scary leap that I think all of us that have, have gotten into business have taken and said, okay, Let's do it, right? And um, so that's scary to begin with, but because it's so scary, it is easy to get discouraged when things aren't going your way, when you don't know where the next deal is coming from, where you know the numbers are you're not hitting your goals and the numbers just aren't there for you. Um, and all of them have talked about how not only has that happened in their career, but they know it's probably going to happen again. And maybe it's happened multiple times for them. Hiro uh, actually mentioned how. Um, he ended up in a, a motorcycle accident and had to take some time away from real estate for a little bit for a number of months. Um, and during that time, he was, you know, getting discouraged. He couldn't do what he wanted to and he couldn't hit his goals and, you know, all of those sorts of things. And they all talked about how at some point in your career, you need determination. You need some self-confidence in yourself to say, I got this. I can do this. You know, I know I have this in me. Um, and have that faith in yourself. Uh, Hiro told a story about when he started in the business, he didn't have much uh, in terms of sales skills um, and went out and was making cold calls and was trying to make individual, you know, door knocking and so on and trying to make individual sales. Hiro got 47 no's in a row uh, before getting his, his, his first yes on that 48th. Um, and what he talked about though was that it took some time to figure out uh, that he needed to learn to listen and that it wasn't, um, you know, so much the sales pitch that he was making, but it was his ability to listen to what everybody was saying, uh, react on the fly and really tune in to what he was hearing and, and what people were asking for. Um, 
Nicolette talked about competing with established agents. And, you know, she basically said, I'm not going anywhere. Early on, she had the buyers um, because she knew people that were moving to the area. She had a good sphere for that. And she was bringing a lot of buyers um, and qualified buyers to that area to the table. And because of which she basically said, look, I got a lot of the buyers. I'm not going anywhere. Um, you know, you got to kind of let me in the door. And she worked her way in and, and just made it very clear that, that, you know, she wasn't a fly by night. She was sticking around. Um, and that uh, the next two are, you know, Carissa talked about when she hit a plateau, she really didn't get discouraged. Um, and one of the things she did is reached out to her mentors. I think that is an absolutely great, great point that when, you know, you do get discouraged. Um, if you do have mentors out there, it's a good time to reach out to them. Funny enough, I'm actually releasing an article today on mentorship, how to find mentors, um, how to pick a mentor, you know, how to ask for help, all those sorts of things. So definitely check that out on the Agent Inner Circle blog. Um, but yeah, hit a plateau. She didn't get discouraged. Reach out to her mentors, which was really key. We talked about it before, but she set small achievable goals and it helps her from getting discouraged to begin with because she's able to keep hitting those goals and keep that train rolling. <laughs> There's a great um, section in a book called, funny, uh, the book's called Good to Great by Jim Collins. Um, There's a great section in it uh, that talks about flywheel, which is it takes a lot of motion and effort to start a flywheel spinning but that once you have it started, you can give it little pushes to keep it going. And I think that's something about that, that hitting those little goals to keep that piece of encouragement to keep yourself going, which is really key. Um, and I'll close that with saying that Hiro made an incredible point, which is that we've all been there um, and we will be there again. It's, there are points in business where you will get discouraged. It happens. It happens to all of us. The real trick is what you're, what you can do um, if you are feeling discouraged, and how you can overcome those challenges and whatever thing, whatever individual challenge that that might be. And I really want to tell you that there are mentors that are here to help. Um, there are people who, and I'm not talking about you need to go buy money, you know, and spend money on a coach. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about really true mentors in the industry who are here to help, who are here to guide people, um, who have been through a lot of these challenges before and are you know, happy to help agents um, because they know what the struggle is like and if they can ease that burden on somebody else, they want to do that. So if you are feeling discouraged, um, if you're ever struggling um, with a plateau that you're hitting, um, you know, when you're not sure what direction that you need to head in, um, I think it's a great opportunity and a great time to reach out to a mentor. And that's actually why I want to bring up um, and share this with you, which is the Facebook groups uh, that are available to you that are chock full of mentors. Um, the first one is the Agent Inner Circle private group. Totally free to join. Free access. There's a ton of content in there. A uh, ton of things for agents to use. Um, but what I really love is that agents ask a lot of questions and not the, I'm not talking the typical, like, ask your broker type other groups. Um, I'll give you a, a hint in terms of how good we are with this. Throughout all of this, we're talking COVID, pol political stuff, all of it. Uh, I have not had to moderate any comments in our group whatsoever. None. Um, I have not had to... Uh, I, there have been a couple of people who posted like their listing or an open house. I'm sure it's just like an assistant posting it to all their groups. Um, but I've not even had to do that. I've not had to, to delete posts or do anything. It is truly, it's about 2,500 people. It is some of the top, I mean, you know, top leadership through NAR, WCR, CRS, RRC, um, you name it, the leadership is there. Uh, it's kind of amazing to see um, the people have, that have come in, in and gotten involved. So I would absolutely uh, recommend getting involved in the Agent Inner Circle group because there are a ton of people there who are always happy to help um, fellow agents. Uh, and there's a ton of content that gets put out there as well. The other one is we have a zero to 60 surviving and thriving in your first five years in business uh, group. This is going to be around for a limited time. I think we're going to run this for probably the next four to six months is my guess. 
Um, basically, we wanted to put a group together just in case anyone had specific questions for any of the panelists uh, that were involved in this group, um, wanted insights from any of them directly. So I wanted to make sure that you had access uh, to them. I'm in there as well, but I want to make sure that you had access to them as well um, because they are uh, incredibly, incredibly talented agents who are happy to give back because that's just the kind of people that they are. So um, those are the groups. If anyone wants to join, please do so. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, and that being said, I'm going to wrap it up here today um, because we have recapped, you know, absolutely all, I won't say all, but a lot of the main takeaways and the things that can change your business uh, from this session. Now, let me ask, are there any questions from the group? Please uh, throw them in the questions or throw them in the chat section. Um, I would love to hear any insights or takeaways or thoughts or comments or anything like that from anyone. Um, again, my name is Alex Camilio, CEO of the Agent Inner Circle with agentinnercircle.com. Um, go check out uh, agentinnercircle.com. It is free, 100% uh, free and full of every week we put out a blog post and it is not your typical you know, theoretical marketing piece that, uh, hey, cool marketing idea. Now go figure it out. We don't do that. Um, pretty much every piece we put out has some sort of a takeaway, giveaway, download, handout, something that you can actually go take uh, and use in your business today. And as I mentioned, 100% free. That is agentinnercircle.com. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, and then um, sign up if you want notifications from us about when we're putting out new content. Uh, so definitely. Love that. If you're on Facebook, uh, drop a like below, um, drop a comment below. We'd love to hear from you uh, as well as everybody here today in chat. Um, thank you so much. We great to, you know, it's great of you to spend your time with me today. Thank you so much. Um, I greatly appreciate it. I'd also like to thank uh, Craig Grant and the Real Estate Technology Institute for putting this on today. Um, the Real Estate Technology Group is an absolutely incredible um, resource for technology education within the real estate industry. Um, if you are looking for videos, how-tos, and content for uh, how to improve your business and how to take your technology um, and your skills to the next level, Real Estate Technology Institute is the place to go. Lisa, thank you so much. I, gre I greatly appreciate it. Diane, thank you. So Lisa says, thanks for the class. Diane says, thank you so much. Great content, especially for me that I'm new. Thanks again, Diane. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Didi, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Jen, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Diane, since you are new, definitely get involved in those groups. Um, there are a ton of people that are always happy to answer questions in there. So, uh, you know, thank you so much to everybody. You have a wonderful day too, Lisa. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to leave this live for just a couple more minutes here. Uh, answer any questions that um, that people might have. Um, Jen says, not feeling much support from veteran agents. Kathy says, thank you. You know, Jen, um, I don't blame you. I, I think there's sort of a balance there in terms of, you know, it, it's, I'll put it this way. It's also different in your market versus agents that are across the country. I feel like a lot of times veteran agents, especially those veteran agents that are in your market, that are in your backyard, because you know, you're competition at some level. It's this, it's this weird duality that, that we're in in real estate where it's like you, know, you are a colleague, but you're also a competitor at the same time. And, they, and sometimes those kind of go together weirdly. And what I've found is that for agents that are in your backyard that are maybe at your brokerage, it's a little bit harder to find support um, because they see you as a, as a competitor to some level. But if you're able to find people that are across the country, maybe in a different country, you know, maybe in Canada, who knows? Um, if you, you're able to find people that are in different parts of the country, a lot of times they're, I think they're more open um, and more available to help. Uh, because you know, you're not in their backyard. You're not going to take a deal. They're not going to see a yard sign with your name on it on their block, right? They, uh, they're going to see somebody across the country and, and go, wow, that's they're, I'm so happy I helped them be successful. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, finding networks that are maybe 
uh, outside your area and, and mentors that are outside your area, I think are, are really uh, a good suggestion. Um, Esther says, thank you. Great presentation, not new, but wasn't very active. Um, people I know seem to know so many agents, much more experienced than some say don't deal with friends. Yeah, friends are interesting. It, it's sort of a balance, like I said, you know, in, in terms of having a mentor and, and picking somebody or having a mentor that's a friend um, versus somebody that's close to you and so on. You know, I always, I tend to like to have my, my mentors as friends, people that I've built relationships with, um, built, uh, you know, sort of a mentor-mentee type relationship with that I can ask questions. Um, but a lot of it is also providing value back. You know, like it, it's great to go just pick somebody's brain, but it's all about reciprocity. You know, you, you want to go offer, hey, can I do something to help you? Because I want to get better at X. You know, it's not just, hey, help me get better at X. Because, you know, why? Um, see what you can do to help them. See, you know, how you can give that reciprocity and give that sort of value Um and actually, again, I talked about this week a little bit in the blog, funny enough, with the whole mentorship thing. Basically in saying that, you know, it's it's some sort of value. Be upfront about wanting to ask questions and wanting to pick people's brains. Um, also, compliments never hurt, right? Like, if people are good at things, tell them they're good at something. Hey, I'm really impressed by whatever it is that you're doing. You're really good at whatever. I'd love to learn more about it. Can I do this to help you? Um, you know, in, in exchange, or can I do this to help you with whatever? Or what can I help you with? Because I'd like to learn so much about that other thing. So just keep in mind, it's a, um, ah, sellers, buyers as friends, not mentors. So, you know, I know a lot of agents who, uh, thank, thank you for Esther. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I know a lot of, I, I've heard that before about agents saying that, you know, they don't want to, um, they don't want to work with their friends or they don't want to muddy those waters or cause problems or any of those things. I guess I can get that logic. Um, but you know what? I, I work with too many agents who have built their entire businesses. I mean, like agents that are doing 100% referral business for years. Like, like friend Joe Marks, um, he sort of made that his goal. And within a four year time period, went from having to farm leads to a 100% referral business. I mean, it's uh, literally every person on this panel. Um, they might get some leads and some people they don't know and all that sort of stuff, but they 100% work their sphere of influence, their friends, their family, their networks, the people that they talk to in their community. Um, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many agents I talk to on a, I mean, literally daily basis. This isn't like a every now and again. I talk to agents on a daily basis who make their entire careers out of working with their, their friends and family. Um, so, you know, I, can it be messy? Maybe a little bit. Uh, can, you know, things go wrong? Have things gone wrong for people? Sure, but things go wrong. I, I mean, that's life. Um, I think the reality is that, uh, you know, the yeah, you get it, Esther. Um, I just saw your comment there just came through. Uh, no, I don't know that you need new friends. Um, I think a lot of it has to do maybe with just how you follow up with these friends um, how they think of you or might send business to you in a certain way. Um, there's a lot of different things that can do it in terms of, uh, you know, friend groups and, and how you're talking to them. Simply being friends with them isn't going to drive business. In fact, simply being friends and even reminding them from time to time that you're a realtor isn't necessarily going to drive business. There's other things involved, the reciprocity and the value that you're giving them, um, being top of mind at the right time, offering pieces of value, uh, what we call engagement devices um, to get people to respond when they are at that active level uh, and ready to do deals. There's a lot of different things that I think can go into uh, successfully working your your friend groups. Um, but that being said, you know, Esther, one thing you might want to do actually in terms of uh, need new friends or or working that list or figuring out what that list is, 
Um, on Agent Inner Circle, there is a blog post uh, that I did a number of months ago now that talks about building your power list. And, um, and what that power list is, is really going into um, how to find the list of like 150 or 200 people, you know, and it gives you a bunch of sort of like sort of memory or devices that will jog your memory and go, oh, I should add this person to my list. And then like, oh, yeah, this group of people should get added to my list and that sort of a thing. Um, it, it's a pretty helpful tool. A lot of agents end up using it. Um, again, a free tool, you know, a free thing, you know, free download. If you want to go use it, feel free. Uh, it is there and available. Um, all right, we got a question here in the Q and A. Um, so Carrie says, being uh, new as a buyer agent, working as a co-op on a new build construction is such a different process and lots to learn. Um, how excited are the agents representing the builder to teach you things? Are we just supposed to know or have to learn on our own? How are the co-op relationships work usually? That's really interesting. So um, that's a good question. There are a couple people I know in the group, uh, in both those groups that I would connect you with that have done some of that in the past. The co-op relationships themselves, I know a bit about that, and those tend to differentiate uh, market to market a little bit. <laughs> so um, how relationships work in one market in one part of the country and how they work in another part, how they work in New York City versus how they work in Boston versus how they work outside of Boston uh, definitely differ a little bit in terms of how those relationships are dealt and work and so on. That being said, though, I know there are agents out there um, who are happy to share what they know about working with builders um, and uh, representing a builder, how that would work. Um, you know, they, I think there was even a, I want to say there was even a session this year at the NAR conference about working with builders. I would have to go back. I didn't sit on, on that one. I'd have to go back and look. Um, but I know there was a class in, in, uh, within the last two years about that. I believe there was one this year. Um, and then, like I said, there are definitely some people, uh, within both of those groups that I'm happy to, to connect you with, um, who I know work with builders and have worked with builders in the past, um, that can probably give you some insights. Awesome. Tracy saw that there. Thank you so much. Awesome, Carrie. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions before I close this down today? I'm just going to give it another minute or two here, make sure we don't have any questions. I'm actually going to go look uh, over on Facebook uh, really quick and make sure. Patrick says, looking for a source for a virtual assistant. Okay. I, Patrick, you are literally the fourth person to ask me that this week. And I need a better answer. I'm just going to tell you, I personally need a better answer for this question. Um, because uh, I, I'm getting this question quite a bit. Um, it's, uh, it's a great question. Um, I have yet to come across something that I feel is a good uh, works for everybody type virtual assistant. I usually, if I ever get that um, question, my next question is something along the lines of what are you looking for that assistant to do? Because if you're looking for someone that's more of like a transaction coordinator, then I think that's, there's, you know, some services or some things that are better in that realm. If you're looking for somebody that just like books appointments for you, you know, and you don't care how great their English is, I think there's some other, you know, resources and things that um, are, are really, you know, good for you. So I think that uh, it really comes down to, you know, a lot of like what you're going after, what you're going to want them to be managing. If you're going to have them managing any parts of the deal or client relationship, I would try to go more toward a transaction coordinator than a virtual assistant. Um, but like I said, I've literally, I've had that question 
four times this week from random friends of mine saying, hey, do you know a virtual assistant? And I'm like, well, kind of, but, um, and I really wish I had something that was better uh, for everybody. So if you are, um, Patrick, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, email is alexc at agentinnercircle.com. I can throw that in chat as well. Um, but uh, feel free to, to reach out. Um, okay, so, so looking for help with uh, automating social media and a lot of trans and also transaction coordinator. Not good with technology. Gotcha. Okay, let me, um, let me reach out to one of my friends. Um, if you don't mind shooting me an email, Patrick, uh, I'd be happy to do that. And let me get back to Aaliyah's question here. Um, and I'll throw that in. Uh, I'll throw my, hold on. Let me just throw my email in here and then I'm going to go. Um, and then I'm going to go back to Aaliyah's question here. Got it. All right. So Aaliyah, um, what do you suggest is a good way to get the flow of leads coming to new agents? So one doesn't constantly have to worry about them, uh, about when and where the next deal is coming from. You know, Aaliyah, I hear that all the time about um, not having to worry about where the next deal is coming from. And what I would say to you is this. Um, so a lot of times I feel like agents that are new to the business feel like that at some level they have to go farm and get new leads. And what I've found is that a lot of times agents tend to not realize the power of the sphere and of the people that are already um, in their network, in the people that they've worked with in the past, talked to in the past, gone to school with, uh, friends of those people, all of those sorts of things. Um, there's something that I, I do as a, a different webinar that talks about how um, people can really get a hundred thousand dollar income from 200 leads. And in fact, the number is 119 contacts technically can bring you a hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, 119, 120 contacts if you're following up with them, and a hundred percent of the deals that go on within those 120 contacts are coming to you. That's an on average $100,000 a year salary. Not bad. So I think um, the first part of that is flow of leads. So if you haven't already taken some time to go look at and go after your sphere, um, we have a great article on the Agent Inner Circle blog, a great um, piece about how to create your power list and then what to do from there, some great ways to follow up with them. I think we even provide a, a sort of a reactivation or a letter that you can send directly to that power list um, to sort of get those people that you already have that already know, like, and trust you reactivated. Now, if you're already doing something in that extent um, and want to generate leads beyond that, there are a ton of different avenues. But I'll warn you, if you're generating new leads, you're going to have to convert those leads, meaning most of the people when they're coming in as a lead are not coming in and buying a property next week. They're nine months out. They're 12 months out from buying or selling a home. So the key is getting into the pipeline at the correct stages um, and getting in early and positioning yourself correctly in that. Um, I know one of the things that we offer for that uh, is a, a, one of our, a lot of our clients, a lot of people that work with us uh, use something called Service for Life. Um, it's a great uh, ongoing newsletter and content and so on that you can that you send on a monthly basis essentially it's a personal way uh, to follow up um, has nothing to do with real estate and market updates and all that sort of stuff it gives you a really personal way uh, to follow up with the lists that you're you know you're already um, you're already working with and already talking to um, did that help answer your question Aaliyah? Because I get that pain point, right? Where is that next deal coming from? Like, oh my God, I don't know next month, right? But I, when we talk about consistency, it really comes down uh, to working the people you already know and doing a really, really great job um, with those people that, that you already know. So definitely check that out, um, Agent Inner Circle. If I threw my email in here. If you have any questions about where these articles are, any of that sort of stuff, please let me know. Um, I'm more than happy to help. Um, 
All right, let's see if we have any other questions here. Okay. Okay, Shyla, great question. So Shyla says, uh, you speak about sphere, but what if you are new to a city or state? And most of your sphere is back in your hometown. That is a great, great, great question. Um, so you know what's funny is uh, if you hop into the group, um, let me put the email in again. There you go. So um, if you hop in our group, uh, Shyla, um, a friend of mine uh, named Natalie Medina um, moved areas and had to go through this exact, and I mean exact scenario where she's like, yeah, my whole list gone. Um, we also have somebody um, in our group, um, Laura Fangman, uh, who is another great realtor who picked up and moved halfway across the country, uh, moved to Tennessee with her husband, and again, had the exact same situation happen. Um, so I will approve people into the group. If you want to ask that question in the agent inner circle group, um, I will tag those agents um, that I know that have been in that position um, just during the group 10 minutes ago. I know I got to go in and approve. I literally, I see like 25 requests right here. <laughs> oh, hold on, Shyla. Approved. I gotcha. There you go. All right. I'm going to go through and do all that. Um, yeah, I'm sitting here on like 20 plus approvals. Um, but yeah, Shyla, just to preview, if you want to post that in the group, I will uh, tag the agents that I know that have been in that position um, and I they'll respond. That's just who they are um, and more than happy to help because it's different for everybody. It's not necessarily the same solution for every agent, um, especially with you know, COVID and some of the stuff going on right now, some of the community stuff uh, is not, you know, not the best um, or it's not as easy to get involved with a lot of the community things. But uh, Natalie um, has had a lot of success hosting digital events. Uh, she did a, a digital Halloween event. Um, she's doing a, a digital um, a gingerbread and that sort of event. We've been talking about a number of different things. Uh, and um, Actually, Tawny Aubrey, another agent in our group, uh, took these events and then started advertising um, the giveaways and the events and so on in Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace and picked up like 50 or 60 leads in her community in 24 hours because she hosted a digital event, gave away prizes for pumpkin carving and shared it, uh, you know, shared it in a bunch of different places um, in social media, all of which were for free right? Buy a couple gift cards for a, a Halloween pumpkin carving event. Spend, you know, two weeks dealing with it on in a Facebook group, which is free. Post it in Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace, totally free. Um, so everything other than the cost of the, uh, the, the giveaways, um, you know, $1,500 $1, on cost of giveaways, you've all of a sudden cemented yourself as a figure in your community and started bringing people in um, who might be interested in some of the same things as you. Um, da, 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 da. We got one more, Didi. Um, so Didi says, what would you suggest to budget for a closing gift? Um, so I think a, a good, I guess I'm going to ask a question in a question. Actually, before I get to that, um, Shyla, did that help? Let me let me make sure I, I help Shyla first. Um, did that help? If so, let me know and and uh, awesome, perfect. Thank you so much. I just saw you post. I'm going to tag those people as soon as we're done here. Um, awesome. All right, Didi, um, what would you suggest to budget for a closing gift? That's a really good question. So there are a couple different things to think about for this. Um, first of which is, is your closing gift also advertising? So like, there are some, I don't want to call them loopholes, but there are some ways where if you include certain things that are advertising um, within your closing gifts, that those can actually go against your marketing and advertising budget uh, and get written off and so on tax-wise in terms of your marketing and advertising budget as opposed to your gifts. So that's the first thing to think about in terms of what you're sending 
Um, and, and depending on what you're sending and whether it can be accounted for those things, I think you'd have two different sort of amounts or um, you know, what you're able to spend because of how they're coming off your books. The other thing to think about is I think it really more comes down to a percentage than a flat dollar amount. Um, I think a lot relates to you know, the market that you're in. Some agents, you know, when they're doing a million dollar home, then the, you know, the, the GCI that they're making off that is to the extent that like, yeah, they're going to send, you know, hundreds of dollars in gifts and this and that and spread them out over time and so on. That's the other thing that I would think about, though, in terms of a closing gift. Um, an individual closing gift is great, but I know a lot of agents who actually create like a monthly gift budget and will uh, will send multiple gifts over a three month period or a six month period after that closing. Um, and it's not just, oh, here's your one gift um, and you know, that's it. Um, but like, I know some agents will do like a, a wine subscription where they get like two bottles of wine for three months and it's like 150 bucks or whatever it is for the, for the whole subscription and mailing and card and everything that goes along with it. Um, I think there's, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that I've, I've heard that are pretty good ones. I've seen agents, honestly, I've seen agents do anywhere from, you know, a hundred to a few hundred dollar kind of gifts as a sort of standard thing. Um, the more personalized, the better though. And, and think about this, right? The amount of money that you're spending on a gift is great, but let me ask everybody, how many of you have received a gift from a family member that maybe isn't worth much? monetarily in value, but they put so much thought and effort. Maybe it's a piece of artwork. Maybe it's a, I mean, for me, it's things like, you know, my mom would make um, Christmas ornaments and like it's her make, and they're incredible, but like her making that is so much more valuable than any ornament she could have purchased for me, right? There's that sentimental value. There's that thought and time and effort and so on that was put into it. Um, I think it has a lot more to do with the thought that was put in, the time, the effort that was put in, um, than just necessarily the dollar amount. Um, I think there are, like I said, there's some things you can do to work out your budget, your advertising, you know, definitely talk to your accountant, um, and, and, you know, in terms of how that works for you in your state and so on. But I think really it comes down more to how personalized is it? Um, you know, as opposed to just how much you spent on the thing. I hope, I know that was a bit roundabout, um, Didi. I apologize that it didn't give you a direct, exact answer. Um, but yeah, I think that's awesome. You like the personalized gift idea. Awesome. Um, cool. Boy, we had some good questions today. These are, I, man. Like it's, uh, I was I was worried there for a second. I was like, Are they engage? Do they like this? And I was like, Oh, geez. <laughs> um, all right, we are running. It is now ten past. I'm going to close this down today. Uh, I know a bunch of folks had to jump off at four and either had other meetings or things like that. Um, so if you do have other questions, I'm going to go approve everyone into the group. Uh, right now. Um, so give me a couple minutes here and let me handle that. If you do have more questions, feel free to post them in the group, um, post them in comments in our blog. Uh, I put my email in chat. You're always welcome to get in touch with me because we are all about helping. Um, and that being said, uh, my name is Alex Camilio. I am the CEO of the Agent Inner Circle with agentinnercircle.com. Um, thank you so much to everyone today. I hope you all have an amazing day. Uh, and I really appreciate the time that you took to spend with us. So uh, I'm going to close it out. Alex Camilio, um, really appreciate everyone's time. Um, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And again, thank you to the Real Estate Technology Institute uh, and Craig Grant for putting this on. We greatly, greatly appreciate it, appreciate you. So definitely uh, check out the Real Estate Technology Institute as well. Thank you so much. I hope you have an amazing day.